Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well. Good to see everyone here. Let's stand, and then I'll open up a prayer, and then we'll do some worship. Father, we come before you, Lord, and I just thank you so much for your faithfulness and all you're doing in our lives, Lord, just bringing us all here and just opening up these doors to fellowship and just meet together and come and gather, Lord. We thank you so much um, that you've given us this place, this building, Lord, and I just pray that you go before today's service, that it would go well, Lord, that you would just prepare our hearts during this time of worship, that you would just be in this place. We love you and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Let's see him come. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. Let's sing, you've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. You conquer the grave, you free every captive, break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great, you have done great. There's nothing worth more that could ever 
Baby. Mm-hmm. 
Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you here at church today, rather than home sleeping in or whatever else you do as we begin this holiday season. Good to see you here. So if you have a bulletin, let's open it and go over the announcements together. And our first announcement concerns Christmas shoe boxes, and today is the last day to turn those boxes in. And if you have any questions, you can see Gina Dyer uh, about that. But today is the last day for the shoe boxes. 
Thanksgiving food and fellowship immediately after the service. We're going to be meeting in the cafeteria and just have some fellowship and finger foods and all and some desserts. And it's for everyone. So whether you brought something or not, why don't you make sure that you come over for the time of fellowship. Wednesday night prayer and praise this week. Uh, not going to have anything. Just be home with your family for Thanksgiving. That's, of course, Thanksgiving Eve. And so encourage you to spend it with your family. Ladies' Cozy Christmas Cookie Exchange will be December 10th at Nancy's house. You can sign up in the foyer today, ladies, for this cookie exchange. Prince of Peace Pageant Live Nativity. And this is for everyone as well. If you'd like to join us on Saturday, December 10th, the same day as the cookie exchange, but this is in the evening at 7 p.m. And we'll be walking through the different scenes uh, commemorating the birth of Christ. Lastly, Christmas caroling, something we've done every year, or at least the last couple of years. Uh, Saturday, December 17th, more information to come. It will be around the neighborhood. And I'll, again, time to be determined. So let's pray for tithes and offerings this morning. Father, again, we thank you so much to be able to gather, to worship you this morning, God, to cast the busyness really aside, to focus our heart, focus our attention on you, that you would speak to us that we'd have a rich time in fellowship with you today, God. And just as part of that, Lord, just the richness we have is, has come from you. So we want to give back to you our tithes and offerings, God. Just a portion of that which you've given to us. We ask you to bless these funds, that they would continue the work of Calvary Gateway uh, in our community and even around the world. And we thank you for the opportunity to give this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
there is triumph in your presence healing in your peace so i will lift my voice proclaiming victory there is triumph in your presence healing in your peace so i will lift my voice proclaiming victory there is triumph in your presence healing in your peace so i will lift my voice proclaiming victory there is triumph in your presence healing in your peace so i will lift my voice proclaiming victory Thank you so much that you are greater than anything that this world has to offer, Lord, anything that um, tempts us, anything that distracts us, Lord, anything in this world, God, that you have overcome the world, Lord, and we thank you so much for your faithfulness, God, and um, just this time of worship, Lord, I pray that during um, this message, God, that you would just move, Lord, that your spirit would be um, in this place, God, and that our hearts would be open and just eager to hear whatever you have um, for us, Lord, and I pray that you would just remove all distractions and that you go before the rest of this um, Thanksgiving week, Lord. I thank you so much just for um, everything that we have to be thankful for. Uh, we love you and praise you, and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. All right. Is everybody getting ready for Thanksgiving? Yeah? No. All right. Good. So let's, let's pray. So, Father, we do thank you again for your goodness. Um, thank you for that time of worship, Lord. And Lord, we can sing songs or we could worship you. Uh, Lord, the choice is ours. And Lord, we could worship you in our own strength or we could allow your spirit to exalt you in our hearts and minds. And so, Lord, again, that choice is ours. And that's what we are in the midst of learning is the role of the Holy Spirit. And how much of our lives do we live in our own strength? How much do we live in our own understanding? How much are we not relying on this beautiful relationship we have with the Almighty God of the universe, with you, the whole, and the, you sending your spirit to live inside of us? So, Lord, let us understand what that means more. Lord, let this translate from just understanding some verses and some intellect to real transition and application and living these things out. So, Father, I pray that you would teach us pray you'd give us understanding. I pray that you would instruct and guide us, that we would walk better, more close, more reliant upon you as a result. So we lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, so we're going to be, again, a few different places in Scripture. Uh, we'll, we'll be having some slides up here. You could take notes. I'll have you turn to a few places that we'll be spending a little bit more time. Um, but it was going to be one message. I was going to talk about the gifts this week. Um, but because of Thanksgiving and stuff, I figured, oh, we'll break this up into two. And so this week we're going to talk about, a bit about the gifts um, and uh, in general. But next week we're going to focus on, and I'll define what I mean by that, more of the miraculous gifts. I think those are the most misunderstood. Because we misunderstand them or don't understand them, we have a tendency to recoil or abuse them. And so I think it's important to understand what they look like and how they might operate in our lives and even as the church as a whole. So again, we'll continue on for where we left. I kind of want to remind us a little bit about what we learned last week uh, because it will, I, th I think, set the stage and the framework for us as we kind of move forward with today. So we looked last week kind of about more of a high-level overview of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in general in our lives. We saw something very important first, that the Holy Spirit's both a person and is God. And I think that's important for us to realize and wrap our mind around that the God of the universe, again, fills us at the time of salvation. And he is a person. He's not an it or a thing or a force. Uh, he is a person that re resides within us. And so there's intimacy, there's relationship that we have and deep communion that we have with the Spirit of God. Uh, we saw his role first in many places in our lives, one in before we were even saved. And he was the one that convicted you of your sins and my sins for those that have placed faith in Christ. If you haven't yet, he is convicting you. That might be why you're here, you're watching online. It's because you know that you need to get some things right. You know that something's off between you and the Lord. And the Holy Spirit's come to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. So he's come to let us see our need for Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he gives us life. After, and when we place faith in Christ, we become alive spiritually. That, that word alive means primarily proximity. And so because of what Jesus did on the cross, he so thoroughly dealt with what separates us that now the very spirit or presence of God comes and lives inside of us. We also learned something very important that once we receive Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit until we are raptured or the day we die. He doesn't come and go. Uh, and he's always with us. And so that's a great comfort I think we should have. Now, now there's times where you might be thinking, um, I don't feel him in my life. There's been tons of times in my walk with the Lord where I don't feel the Holy Spirit. I don't feel like he's right there close to me. We might look at other people and be like, well, why do we see? It seems like they're so close to the Lord. It feels like he is just abundantly pouring himself. You probably, probably think that about me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, we might look at other people and see like, wow, the gifts or their, their purity, or their commitment to the Lord, they must have more of the Holy Spirit than me. And it feels like the Holy Spirit has left me. But be assured, if you've received Jesus, the Bible's clear, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the redemption of the purchased possession, until you die or are raptured. And so you have the Spirit of God living in you. That's something very important now as we look at these other, remind ourselves of the things we learned last week of what role he plays in our life. What we should be expecting to see is determinant on us. We actually control how much of the Holy Spirit is seen. He is who he is. He wants to do certain things, but he won't force himself on us. So we have to allow him to be in us to, to, and control us in those areas or empower us and lead us in those areas. And so we have to seek him, submit to him, and again, we should expect to see him move in these ways. We see, actually kind of related to, I thought of that this morning, talking about Thanksgiving, but in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we're instructed a little bit about the Holy Spirit. It says, don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, or just reckless abandonment. But be filled with the Spirit. So there's a contrast there. Don't be under the influence of a mindless substance. Instead, place yourself under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 obviously comes after Ephesians 1. And Ephesians 1 is where we learn that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the redemption. So the Holy Spirit is in us. And now we need to actively submit to the Holy Spirit uh, and allow him to do, have his way in us. And as we do, we see the following results. Verse 19, it affects the way that we speak to one another. We speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. As I am sum submitted to the Holy Spirit in me, it should affect the way I communicate. 
I should be talking about the Lord. I should be edifying. I should be um, exalting of the Lord and blessings to other people. Then singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord literally means I strum my heart to God. And so I am oh, inwardly, as I'm submitted to the Holy Spirit, I should be exalting Jesus, lifting him up in my heart and my mind. Three, it affects my attitude, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so instead of being complaining and negative and always seeing the, the, the bad side and the woe is me, as I am submitted to the Holy Spirit, I, I understand God's always in control. God will never leave me nor forsake me. He has a plan and everything, and he, he will be with me through that plan. And he's going to accomplish his will as I surrender to him. And so there's always something to be thankful for. If nothing else, the world could be falling apart, but I have the God of the universe. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. He is with me, and he's going to do great things in my life and through my life. There's always something to be thankful. As we think of Thanksgiving, we're, we always there's, a, there's an abundance of things to thank God for in our lives. And lastly, it's going to affect my interpersonal relationships. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so if I am submitting to the Holy Spirit, it becomes naturally, I, it's much easier to submit to other people. And so I don't, I'm not demanding and self-willed, having things my way. That won't be a mark of someone who is submitted to the Holy Spirit. Then the rest of this chapter and the next give examples of what does it look like to submit to one another. And it gives examples of that in, in home life, uh, husband and wife, parent, child, employer, employee. What does it actually look like to submit in our walk with the Lord? And so, again, as we look at Thanksgiving, we look at this principle of how much I surrender. There's this call, the Spirit of God is in us. We need to submit to Him, and we will see Him live through our lives. We learn the same thing in the book of Galatians. He is in us, He has set us free from the old person, made us new people. Now he is, we, as we submit to him, we are walking in the spirit and we're seeing him and the fruit of the spirit is being born in our lives. And that kind of takes us to the first thing that he does is we learn as sanctification or he is holy, he makes us holy. That's what he wants to do. And so he wants to give us a pure lifestyle. And so as we submit to him, we should expect to see that. Again, as we choose not to seek him and to submit to him, then we won't see purity in our lives. And so there are people that, are, that know Jesus, and we see some evidence of that faith. But man, there's areas of impurity and compromise in their lives that should be evident that they're just not submitting to the Spirit of God that's living in them. They're not seeking and submitting to him and allowing him to purify them. And so we have that ability. We, again, we looked at that. And he does that many ways. First, as I said, he set us free from the old nature. Uh, we learned that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The second thing is he fills us and empowers us to live the way we're supposed to. And the third thing we learn in, in Galatians is that he's an example for us to follow. In Galatians 5, 25, it says, if you've been made alive by the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. It's a different word for walk. It means to walk in line. And so now he's my example. I look for the Spirit and I follow him. And so in every way, he's there to lead and guide us through changing into the image of Christ. To the degree that happens is up to you and me as far as how we let that happen. Not only does he guide us in changing, but he guides us in life. We looked at examples in Acts where he would speak and lead and guide, and he wants to be that in our lives. When there's decisions to be made and direction to be sought, he wants to lead and guide us. He teaches us the word we learned. And again, we could, we're not going to get into each of these because we did last week. This is just a reminder. Uh, he teaches us the word and helps us understand. He helps us in being a witness. Um, there's two parts. I, one, he, he will, as I surrender to him, he'll tell me what to share. He'll put thoughts in my mind, scriptures in my mind, <clears throat> examples to use maybe with someone. I, we could probably have a room full of examples here of people that you're just talking to someone and you just get these ideas in your mind and you start sharing them. And man, it really resonates with them and the Lord is really doing a work. But on the other end too, there's a spiritual issue going on. There, no matter how brilliant I am, no matter, I could be the greatest apologist on earth, have all the answers, but if the Holy Spirit's not there, nothing's going to happen in that person's life. I'm just going to chip away at their mind. Uh, they need to have a heart change, and the Holy Spirit is there to convict, to woo, to do something deeper than I could ever do on my own. And that's a confidence we should have when I share with someone, is that whatever is happening with me, I might, and there's times I'm just dropping the ball. Maybe I'm not 
having the right words. I don't, I don't feel like I got any scriptures. I'm just, man, I just feel like I'm hitting a wall. Be assured the Holy Spirit is still there doing the work. And he will, he will probably make something. There's been times where I've shared with someone, and I just feel, man, that was awesome. Like, I, I just feel like I nailed it. And there's like no result, no, no response, or nothing happens. Then there's times where I'm like, I'm an idiot. Like, I feel like I, I just dropped the ball. I didn't do anything right. And the person's like, man, that was one of the best things I ever heard in my life. You know, and, and that's just all the Lord who will do a work beyond what you're able to do. And that's a confidence we should have. A lot of times we think of witnessing to others and we bear that burden ourselves. It's all up to me. I got to say the right thing, do the right thing. And it, that's what we cower away from sharing. But no. I'm just going to share as the Lord leads and have confidence that he's going to do a work beyond whatever I do at a deeper level in that person. He's there to help us pray, we learned. Uh, Sometimes I don't even know what to pray. Sometimes I think I do, but I really don't. The Lord... The, the Lord cares more for the people we're praying for than we do. He has more compassion. Sometimes my prayers are lifeless and un- incompassionate. I'm just doing it out of obligation. I'm not really insightful into it, but then there's times where I really seek and submit to the Lord. He gives us insight and details and compassion and care for those individuals as we pray. That's why I always tell people that are in conflict with one another, one of the best things you could do as a married couple is spend some time in prayer. You bear your heart. It's very intimate. You're, sh- you're sharing your concerns and your burdens and your perspective before the Lord. <clears throat> you get compassion for one another. Also, people that you have issue with, as you pray for them, the Lord changes your heart. He gives you his compassion as you're submitting to the Spirit, and it changes your perspective of who they are a little bit. There's been many times where I've been at odds with someone and maybe holding something against them, but as I really submit to the Lord and pray for them as the Spirit leads, there's a real work that happens in my heart. And that, that might be the bigger work than even what he might do in their lives. We have a spiritual warfare that we're in, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And isn't it a good thing that your weapons are not flesh and blood? Um, you have this, the, the power of God in Ephesians 6.10 that we're to put on before we go to war with the enemy. And all the elements really are spiritual elements that the Holy Spirit provides. And it ends with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, and to pray always in the Spirit. And we'll again look at that in Ephesians that we're going to next. He gives us assurance of our salvation. He brings unity in the body. There's one spirit. If I am submitted to that spirit and you are submitted to that spirit, there should be a lot of like-mindedness and unity. If you see two people that are at odds, it's probably because one or both aren't submitting to that one spirit that resides within each of them. So he brings unity as we each submit to him in our lives. He gives empowerment to minister to others. Again, that goes beyond just the practical functions that we're meeting. And again, there's many teachers. We're going to learn the different gifts and things, but there's, there's teachers in this school that aren't saved. Then they teach, uh, elementary students, high school students. There's lectures abroad that teach on business and in, in college and universities. And there, there's, there's an element. And then there's teachers in the church, you know, there's pastors and teachers and there's teachers in our youth. What's the difference? Is that a spiritual gift? Well, there's something different as I apply that gift of communication and teaching, but I pair it with the Word and the Holy Spirit. We touch the part of people that people without the Lord can't touch, right? Uh, they, they, they teach your kids math and science, unfortunately, other things in school these days, but it should be math and science and English, and they could teach them intellectually, but as we open up the things of God by the Spirit of God, our spirit and our soul is touched in a deep way that translates into action in a changed life. And so uh, the things of the Lord, as he empowers us, they go beyond what the world offers. And then there's some gifts that there is no parallel in the world. Uh, We don't see anything like that in the world. And that Paul will talk about that in a moment as we get into the gifts. And lastly, he gives us spiritual gifts, as which we're going to talk about here today and next week. But think of that again. I, I can't help as I go over that list how convicting it is. As I was challenged, as I studied that last week and reviewed it this week of, am I including the Lord? Am I seeing the Lord move in all those areas of my life? Am I including him in my prayer life regularly? You know, Um, am I daily allowing him to lead me in prayer? Am I daily allowing him to reveal his word and have some in-depth devotional time in communion with him as I let him and the word minister to me? Am I 
using, am I relying upon him in witnessing to others and for guidance and direction? Again, this great resource that God has given, the person of God himself living in us, how often are we seeking him, relying upon him, seeing him move in these areas of our lives? And so, again, another exhortation and challenge that we would continue to evaluate ourselves in this area. And so now as we look at the gifts real quickly today, as we do kind of an, uh, the first part of this, we could have chosen any of the areas I just mentioned, and, and we'll go through them. It's not like we're going to neglect those. And I, I, we'll, we'll go through many of these things even as we hit Ephesians, these different areas of our life, like sanctification and warfare and so forth. We'll go a little bit more in depth. But I, I, I thought it was important that we looked a little bit more at the spiritual gifts because there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of abuse that we see. And so we have a tendency because of our misunderstanding of them to either see abuse or neglect. And I think many times you're either all in or all out in the spiritual gifts, right? There's some churches that are all in and too in, right? And you see them maybe being abused or overused and misused scripturally. And we might walk in and like Paul says, hey, they walk in and everybody's doing this. They're going to think you're nuts. And so sometimes there's times that it gives that appearance like, man, this is kooks, right? This isn't my personality. This isn't who I am. This doesn't seem right. And so I don't want to have anything to do with that. We could recoil too far. I know a little bit of the history even of the Calvary chapels is, you know, afterglows were a common occurrence after every service in the early days of Calvary Chapel. They would have a time after the Bible study of just waiting on the Lord, seeing the gifts exercised. Then within Calvary chapels, there was a split. Uh, the vineyard movement came out, and then we saw an abuse of the spiritual gifts, where they, they just flat out said that the Bible isn't the only standard of what God would do, and we have to be open to go beyond what the Word says. And that was a real breaking point between, the because uh, all of them were a part of uh, Calvary Chapel. I think it was w Wimber uh, was one of the guys w was in Calvary Chapel, and he started having these ideas, and the other Calvary Chapel pastors were like, no, the Word is the standard. We can't do anything outside of what the Word instructs and guides us to do. So they got into weird things like barking in the Spirit and... Um, acting like animals and being slain in the spirit, all these odd things that we don't find in scripture. And so there was a breaking between Calvary Chapel and the vineyard movement. But what happened a lot in Calvary Chapel is they recoiled, a lot of them maybe a little too far, and they just kind of shut down all these times of waiting on the Lord and seeing the gifts move because they wanted to remove themselves far from that and the abuse of it. So I think there's that balance in our lives that we have to say, I don't want to not move in things that God has described or prescribed. Um, I just need to understand them so we're not uh, abusing them. So with that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12. And we're, we're going to just look at a few verses here uh, because this is one portion where Paul gives a great deal of instruction about the spiritual gifts. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning spiritual, it really just means, it, the word there is just spirituals. Uh, but we attach gifts there for clarity. Uh, you might see it's in italics in your Bible. But now concerning the spirituals, or spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. That's an important verse there. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Uh, then he'll move on from there. But first thing to note here, this is something that we're not supposed to be ignorant of. Just because we don't understand it or we see it being abused doesn't mean then we recoil and just let's just not talk about spiritual gifts or see them moved. Interesting, three things Paul uses this phrase on. I don't want you to be ignorant about three things specifically. The nation of Israel, spiritual gifts, and the second coming. And those are three things people don't want to talk about or there's confusion about. But the scriptures are pretty clear, and it says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant or not understand these three things. So spiritual gifts is something maybe you have kind of withdrawn from. That's something God doesn't want you to withdraw from. He wants you to understand those things. Verse 2 seems like an odd verse. You, were, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. What does that have to do with spiritual gifts? Well, before they knew the Lord, they had nothing like this. They followed, in quotations, gods, right? But they were not real gods. They were dead, lifeless idols that they worship. No reality, no interaction. Now they had a relationship with a true and living God 
who interacts with them, fills them, gives gifts to them. So there's no frame of reference that they used to have that they have now. Again, these spiritual gifts are unique to what God is doing uh, in their lives. And so one, he reminds them what, what a blessing this is. But two, don't let their lack of experience or frame of reference cause neglect or abuse in these things. So essentially, forget what your experience is. Forget what you think you know. Forget maybe the negative experiences that you've had. And let the Lord instruct you on how you should understand these things. Don't go off experience, again, or what you had. And the same applies for us. You know, when you're talking to someone, and you could talk to people that are religious, people that go to church, but you could tell when they don't have a relationship with the Lord. And, and you see something is missing there, and you're trying to communicate, no, you're serving, essentially, you're serving dead idols. I, you don't have that relationship. You think you do. You think, hey, we're, we're both the same. We go to church. You have your relationship with God. I do. But you can just tell by the way they talk. They don't personally know God. He's not a reality. He's not someone they interact with. They see his power and movement in his life. And, 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 and there's something in their yearns. And that's how we used to be. Uh, before we knew the Lord, we served dead idols, in a sense. We, we worshipped or did things that um, weren't like the, the living God. And there's no parallel to many of these gifts that we had in the world. We weren't, unless you were into maybe demonic or counterfeit activity and you saw occultic practices and possessions, there's really no example of being filled with something outside of yourself to influence the way you live and give you gifts and operations. And so that's a unique thing to most of us. And don't let your lack of frame of reference cause you to recoil or abuse these things. Forget what you think you know. Now, maybe before you came to the Lord, again, you'd see these guys on TV or you walk into a certain church and you saw things going nuts and you're like, yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with that. You know, then you go to a church that's maybe more reserved or ordered and you're like, yeah, this is more my style. This feels more comfortable. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't real spiritual gifts and the movement and activity of the spirit that we don't want to understand so that the Lord could uh, move in us as we live that way. So real quick, let's go over maybe some of the, the gifts the, that the Lord does give, and they're found in different places in Scripture. I'm just going to read some of them to you. Some of them we'll call miraculous, others just non-miraculous. So we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we learn that there's apostles and prophets, teachers, um, workers of miracle, kinds of healing, helps, administration, tongues, uh, also in 1 Corinthians 12, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, distinguishing or discerning of spirits, interpretation of tongues. Uh, we see in Ephesians, added to that, apostles, prophets, we see evangelist and pastor, teacher. In Romans, we see some more gifts mentioned, serving, encouraging, contributing, leadership, mercy. In 1 Corinthians even 7, we see marriage and celibacy as two different gifts given by the Lord. And so we see a, a variety of different gifts that God gives to his people for us to operate within. And again, we could look at those as two kind of different categories we might see as miraculous and non-miraculous. They're all miraculous in a sense in that they all come from the Lord. But in another sense, there's, a, there's a, maybe a narrower definition of miraculous. And I think that we see that even in scripture, which we'll talk about in just a minute, the two different words that are used here with the gifts. Uh, but I'll, I'll quote here, it's a, a miracle or a miraculous gift is a less common activity of God in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. And so some of these miraculous gifts uh, inspire amazement or awe in those that are observing them. And these are things that go beyond like teaching or administration or helps that we might classify as non-miraculous. And we th see things like prophecy, healing, casting out demons, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Um, those, those are the types of things we're going to look at that um, those inspire awe. We see that, we see somebody get healed and somebody that came in and we know them and we know, we see descriptions in the Bible and also active today examples of healing people that had physical problems and God healed them at that moment. And so that inspires awe. And, and the intention is to draw attention to the message of the gospel, to bring glory to the Lord. And we'll talk about that kind of as we go through this study as well. So next week, we'll take a closer look at those miraculous gifts. 
kind of define what they are and see what they might look like in our lives personally, but also as a group, as we gather, what they would look like in a, in a general assembly if those gifts were being exercised. Next thing we see, too, is that we should expect them to be seen in a church. And I think in a healthy church, we would expect God to give kind of a, a, all these gifts. Because once we see the purpose of the gifts, we should expect to see them being used within the body of Christ, or people given these gifts at different times to operate within. And so they were promised in the Old Testament, uh, Joel 2, 28 and 29. I think we have a, a, a slide if you want to look it up or take a note. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my maidservants and on my uh, men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, to us, we are that are familiar with the New Testament, um, we're, that shouldn't sound odd to us. But in the Old Testament, that was a huge promise because we talked last week that everybody that received Jesus did not get the Holy Spirit, or I, I should say that everybody who was in a covenant relationship with God did not get the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And so um, if they were in the nation of Israel, they kept the law, all those things, only certain people received the Holy Spirit for certain tasks for a certain period of time. We'd see priests or kings or judges. The Spirit of God would come upon them to accomplish some task. But it wasn't guaranteed to everyone within Israel. Then there's this promise that there's a day coming where everyone, no class distinction or anything, everyone is getting the Holy Spirit. Then we see when did that come? We see it initiated with Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it's, Jesus said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. John the Baptist said that one is coming after me who will baptize in both the Holy Spirit and fire. And so, and that was Jesus. And Jesus had the authority not only to receive and operate in the Spirit, but then to give it to other people. Then we see it started in the Gospels as he gave the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit to his disciples. In Matthew 10, 7 and 8, he told the disciples, And go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received freely you give. And so now we're seeing the movement of it. It goes from Jesus, also with the authority to dispense, starting with the apostles, but then on the day of Pentecost, after his death and resurrection, the floodgates opened. This was the day that Joel spoke of. The Spirit of God was now given to all because of what Jesus had done. And then in Acts chapter 2, we see that all, were, that all those present were filled with the Spirit. And we see the first gift there, they spoke in tongues. The word tongues just means languages. So they spoke in a multitude of different languages, and they were, they were declaring the wonderful works of God. They were praises to God. And we'll learn more about tongues next week. Um, but it drew many people then to hear a message spoken in their common unified language. So the message was not communicated in tongues. It was communicated in, the message they in a language they understood. And Peter preached the gospel, and many people got saved. So then we see not only through the book of Acts, these gifts in operation, we see healings and we see prophecy and we see tongues and interpretation. We see all these things happening in the book of Acts. And then we see in the epistles, what we referenced already in Romans and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, where now Paul is giving instruction. Even Peter talks about them giving instruction about the operation of the gifts. What's interesting too is that um, in all these places, there's not instruction about how to how about the gifts. There is just a reference to them. The, the purpose that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, for example, 12, wasn't to teach them about the gifts of the Spirit. It was given, you guys are all operating in them. 
And, and actually, you were abusing them. And so he was calling, run to bring order in, verse, uh, in chapter 14. But mainly the purpose of chapter 12 was to bring unity. Because they were operating so much, they started having divisions among themselves. They started classifying their gifts and thinking they were better than other people based on the gifts they were given. And Paul's stress in chapter 12 is it's the same spirit who gives to each one for the edification or the building up of all. And so you're all equal. You all have different gifts and you're all interdependent. Not one person gets them all. We each get different ones. And as we come together, it's a beautiful thing because we see all the gifts being used and operated for the benefit of all. And so we see all this instruction given. Nothing is referenced except in one place, which I'll talk about, about it ending and that not being the case. It was prophesied. Jesus brought it. Jesus gave it to the church. It's taught about in the epistles. And so we should expect to see them in our church today. The only place it's referenced, there is going to be a day where the gifts will cease. That's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the very next chapter over in verses 8 to 12. Let me read those to you. So Paul says this, right in the middle of talking about all the gifts, the supremacy of love in chapter 13. In verse 8, he talking about the supremacy of love over the gifts, uh, he inter introduces this. He says, love never fails, but whether there's prophecies, they will fail. Whether there's tongues, they will cease. There is knowledge, it will, where there's knowledge, it will vanish. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And so some will look at this and say, the, well, one, there's no debate really within the church that all the gifts have gone away. Um, just the miraculous. So people, st the whole church still believes there's a gift of teaching and administration and helps. That's not debatable. What they're referring to is the miraculous gifts like tongues and prophecy that are referenced there. And they'll say that that which is perfect, when is that? When that which is perfect has come, then these gifts will cease and they will no longer be needed. And so there, within the church, there's some that say, hey, that is when the fulfillment of Scripture came. That which is perfect, when the canon of Scripture was closed, the gifts are no longer needed. Or when maturity to the church comes, then the gifts are no longer needed. Or when the Gentiles are included in, uh, in the church, then that, that which is perfect, the work of God has been done. Because the gifts they see are, are used to bring people to Christ. And so they're no longer needed. But that is pretty much a weak argument. And interpreting this verse that way is you're bringing in that thought that the gifts have ceased to interpret this verse. Because when you look at this verse, it interprets itself. Because verse 10, when the, that which is perfect has come, it's told which that is perfect. In verse 12, when we see, our see, when we see face to face, when we are with the Lord. So whenever we're, when we're raptured, or really it's when the Lord returns, the second coming of Christ, when he comes to establish his kingdom on earth, that's when that which is perfect has come. So verse 12 interprets when that which is perfect, and it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it makes sense because we'll see what the purpose of the gifts are next. But God gives these spiritual gifts to his church while we are waiting for the return of Christ. Part of the purpose of the spiritual gifts is to give us a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. And so we have things like words of wisdom and knowledge and all these things that are being operated. We see in part now, but when we get to heaven, we'll see the fulfillment. We won't need prophecy anymore. We won't need words of wisdom and knowledge. These things will be unnecessary. We won't need tongues because we'll be talking to God directly um, and we'll be having a common language. And so we won't need these gifts. So we have them now. Uh, in part, until that which is perfect, or we are with the Lord, is complete. So let's look real quick then. Not only is it a foretaste, but what are the other purposes? Why does God give the gifts? Verses 3 to 7 in 1 Corinthians 12. It says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all in all. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so we see in these verses kind of two additional reasons, always for the glory of Jesus. The gifts aren't given for the benefit of the individual using them. That's how they were using them in Corinth. They were, they're a trippy church. They were operating abundantly in the gifts of the Spirit, but they were extremely carnal. Earlier in this book, I think it's chapter 3, in one sentence Paul calls them brethren and carnal in the same sentence. They were divisive, they were petty, they were tolerant of gross immorality that the world wouldn't even tolerate, yet they operated abundantly in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And because of their carnality, they took their operation of the gifts and they boasted over one another. They categorized themselves. They thought they were better. I'm, I have the gift of prophecy. I'm better than you with the gift of whatever. And so they would categorize themselves based on the gifts. And Paul's saying, you guys are all messed up. He says, you're carnal. These things are for the, one, the glory of Jesus first, and two, we're going to see the, in these verses there, for the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. They're for the benefit of others, not yourself. So it's the great commission, the great com uh, commandment, loving God and loving others. That's what the gifts are given. They're in alignment with those things. The gifts are given to honor and glorify God. The gifts are given to benefit and bless others. We see that in verse 7 here. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. In uh, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. We see the same thing. We won't go there, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, it's for the benefit of the whole body that each part does its share. And so we operate in our gifts for the, for the building up of the body and the equipping of the saints. Since this is our continued purpose, right, to build up the body, to honor the Lord, and we should, again, expect these gifts to be used and operated in for us today. We also notice here in these verses the different words that are used for the gifts. Real quick, these two words, we see ministries and act activities here. Uh, but they're all manifestations of the same spirit. That word ministries is uh, referring to just set offices. These are more of the, you might call them maybe the non-miraculous gifts the set operation that we see ongoing. So we see things like apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist, things like administration, helps. Those are things that are in, in constant operation in the individual's life that they're settled and operating in. This word activities is more of a d dynamic word, like a powerful interaction, like something that might happen not on an ongoing necessarily basis, but at a given moment for the demonstration of the glory of God. Dave Guzik on these words here, he says, the differences between gifts, ministries, and activities. All of these are gifts. Some gifts are ministries, standing offices, or positions in the church, and some gifts are activities, miraculous events or outpourings at a particular time and place. So we might see somebody doesn't have the ongoing necessarily, wherever I go, I'm going to heal someone, or I'm going to give a prophecy or a word of wisdom, but they may have that gift that God operates in them at given times, uh, at a given moment for, again, the edification of others or the glory of God. And so these would be more of the activities. Um, I don't always operate. Like if I have the gift of teaching, I'm always going to have that desire to communicate truth with other people in an effective manner. If I have the gift of helps, I'm always going to want to run and help and meet the need. Or administration, I'm just administratively minded. And so I like to organize and take the lead and help put things together. Those are more settled gifts that we see in ongoing operation. But again, if I have the gift of prophecy or tongues, I might not always be able to operate in those. They're given by the Spirit at, at particular moments. And so those are more of the activities that we see. But again, the focus of all these is the one God who gives them all. So we see diversity, but unity in the body here. And it kind of as we wrap up here, another thing to notice here, just like how we see the work, the general work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we opened with, sanctification, um, sharing, being a witness, prayer, we see the Holy Spirit in those things. It's up to us to control. How much of him do we see in our lives? It's up to us. Same thing with the gifts. How much we see these gifts really being used and developed falls on us. It's up to God to give them as he sees fit. They're given by the Spirit, so he chooses who and what he gives, but we have a part to play too. We could neglect the gifts 
We could bury the talents and not use them, and we see a, a lack of proficiency in our gifts. We see this also in a couple places in Scripture. Um, we see with uh, Paul telling Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy 4.14, he says, Do not neglect the gift you have. Also in 2 Timothy 1.6, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. Um, and then also in Romans, he talks about um, prophesying in proportion to our faith. And so, again, there is a relationship to the gifts and how proficiently they're used, whether we allow them to be used or not. So you may have gifts that you're not even aware of, that you're not seeking to use, or you may know the gifts that you have, but if you don't utilize them, then they won't be as proficient in your life and you won't see them being operated or fine-tuned. Like, like teaching. I've changed a great deal in teaching. I watch an old video of mine and I'm not, you know, I'm no Spurgeon or anything, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. So kudos to, to that. <laughs> but a lot of that comes from trying to grow in it. L watching my pacing, watching filler words that I use, watching phrases that I might repeat. I still do all those things, but far less. I remember I always used to teach hyper fast because I'd get really excited about teaching and I would get up and I would, and people would be polite and they'd come up and, and comment. But essentially, I, afterwards, I took it as a compliment, but at, at the end, I'm like, I think they were trying to tell me to slow down because I would just get super fast and rattle things off. And so it takes a lot for me. If I get really excited, I do that now. And so I have to be very conscientious to watch my pacing. But see, again, the gift is from the Lord teaching. He's called me to pastor teacher, but I play a part in using it, exercising it, and seeing it find, refined so that the Holy Spirit uses it. Same thing with all the gifts. Whatever they are, we recognize them, we put them to use, but we also let the Lord refine and hone them to make them more efficient. And so, again, the, that dual role there. And so the encouragement, I think, as we look at this is the gifts are there. God has given you gifts. If you have received Jesus, he has, he has distributed to each gifts. You may have one, you have, may have multiple gifts. You may have some gifts, and there's others you don't even know you have. My encouragement to you would really be to go over the list of the gifts, really pray, ask the Lord to show you and reveal what gifts you have, and then ask him to show you how am I to use these gifts. I want to see them put into practice. I remember the first few times I taught was horrible. Um, before I came, this is even funny, before I even got saved, I would never want to be a teacher. I remember giving public presentations in high school. It was humiliating. I, I, would, I hated being in front of people. I would turn bright red. I would sweat profusely. I would fiddle all the time, and I would wring my hands. They had to give me objects to hold on. I was, I, and I don't see this as hyperbole. I was literally probably the worst public speaker I knew in, in high school and junior high. I, I was petrified of it. And then I get saved, and God's like, you know what I'm going to make you? you know? And it just goes to show you that, again, that's, I would never have chosen anything like this. And I remember even the first time I was called to share in front of people, I remember sitting in the back of a room that I was about to share in, and I was literally praying for, for an earthquake. <laughs> I was praying that there would be something, don't, don't hurt anybody, Lord, but like cut the power out, like let's end the service here. Drop a can on the floor, something like that. But do something to end the service, but the Lord had me do it. So again, I was petrified of having to do that. But again, with practice, with use, then they get refined. So again, encouragement is to seek the Lord on what those things are. Understand what they are from Scripture. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, As each of you have received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The gifts that you have, again, they're used for God's glory and the benefit of others. You're a steward of them. Uh, you're a servant of them. And so for you to neglect them is you're being a poor steward. And so make sure you know what your gifts are and that you're seeking the Lord on how they're to be used. Again, if you don't, seek them out. And again, that's something too I think the church has a, a, a part in. We both play a part. I think in the church, that's a, that's a hard part about a small church. Is, is There's not as many ministries that maybe you could fit your gift into. And so that's one thing I do is I always try and see the gifts of other people and how we could use those or encourage them to use them. And so I think that's something too part of the eldership of the church is to recognize the gifts and seek to provide opportunities for those gifts to be used. 
Um, the other part of that, though, falls on each of us, is we should each be seeking to discover our gifts. And how do you do that? I think some of it is just, they go along with your natural abilities and inclinations that you have, right? Uh, some of you like to teach. Some of you like to communicate truth to other people. You like to learn things and help people understand it. That's the basis of teaching right there. That's something that God, that's, that's how teaching starts, is you like, you like to understand and give that understanding to other people. You want them to understand as well. And so if maybe that's you, you find that, but you've never really used that gift of teaching or communicating. There's people I know that are really versed in scripture, really knowledgeable. I would think, man, that you'd make perfect teachers, but they don't have that gift of teaching. They don't, they're not driven with that same, same calling of God or gifting of God to communicate that truth. They could do it one-on-one, -on -one, they could disciple, but they're not called to be in front of groups or teach people that way. Uh, maybe you're drawn to kids and you just want to do that. Maybe you just have this, when you walk into a room, you're looking for things that need to be done. Maybe you have the gift of helps. You're just always gravitated to helping other people or helping where there's a need. I know there's a guy, I know a guy for years who was a mixed bag. The, the guy had the gift of helps like nobody I ever met, but he also had no control over his, his tongue or his temper. And so he would come into a room and he would help and he'd hurt at the same time. You know, he'd be hurting people verbally, but helping practically. And so I'm like, man, it's just a, a, a interesting. It's like God gives his gifts without discretion. But one thing is he uses gift. And so he would come in and, and do that. Uh, administration, you like to organize or lead things. And maybe you just find yourself encouraging other people. You have that natural ability like a Barnabas. You like to counsel help people through and work through issues in life. I know there's, there's all kinds of things. What are your interests? What are your inclinations? Especially after you've gotten saved, um, those, are the, those are maybe more of the ministries that we talked about, that the, the on, ongoing, the settled things in your life that God has given you to operate in the body. And then there's things, again, we'll talk about next week, like the gift of, uh, like the words of wisdom and knowledge and prophecy. Maybe God wants to use you with those things, but you've never been open. You don't understand them, or you're not in an environment where it's open to use those things. And so we want to kind of teach and instruct. Again, I don't see us using them here on a Sunday morning, but like on our Wednesdays gathering, it's very intimate and close. It's much more similar to the environment of, first, of the first century church as they gathered in, in houses and in small groups and we'll kind of talk about what that structure looked like next week. But again, in a healthy church, I would expect God to give a diversity of all these gifts and for them to be in operation. One last note as we close for the third time is um, the gifts aren't a sign of maturity, right? Just because someone operates in their gifts and has gifts doesn't mean they're mature. God's more concerned about your maturity than he is about the gifting. God's gifting is he just gives gifts even to the immature. And so uh, you want to grow mainly in your character. Your you want that sanctification work, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the big thing that God wants to work in your life. There's, again, Corinthians is a great example. They were carnal, immature, divisive, but they flourished in the spiritual gifts. And so we want both. We don't want to neglect one for the other, but definitely we want to make sure our maturity and our growth is in place as we operate in those gifts. So as we, as we kind of wrap that up, as we look at those things, um, think of the general work of the Holy Spirit. Enjoy that. Uh, again, is he operating in all these areas of your life? Are you surrendering to him in sanctification? Uh, are, you, are you changing? Are you growing in your walk? Are you looking for the, to surrender to the Holy Spirit so he can conform you to the image of Christ? Be assured that he'll never leave or forsake you. Um, always be looking, relying, and submitting to him. Then your gifts. Do you know what your gifts are? Do you know all of your gifts? And are they in operation? Are you actively looking how God wants to exercise the gifts? They're gifts. Freely you have received, freely you give. They're not for you to sit on. Remember that parable of the talents. The guy that got scolded and rebuked was a guy that buried his talents for an erroneous reason. And so he got rebuked at the end. And so you have been given some gifts. Use them for the edification of others and the glory of God. Amen? Well, 10 minutes is something, right? I got you out of here 10 minutes earlier. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll go over and eat. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love, Lord. 
And we thank you for the gifts that you've given to us. You've given us salvation. You've given us heaven. And you've given us now here your Holy Spirit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit has come to change us into the image of Christ, to lead us and guide us, to aid us in prayer. Um, all these wonderful things that the Holy Spirit is here. Lord, are we utilizing that? Are we seeking and submitting? Are we including and walking with the Spirit in our lives? Lord, what, and then beyond that, Holy Spirit, you give us gifts. You give us ministries to operate within and then spontaneous gifts miraculous, awe-inspiring gifts you want to give at times so that we can maybe open a door to preach the gospel with someone. You want, maybe even you want to use it to heal someone so that we have an open door to share the gospel. Lord, that might be so far from some of our minds. We don't walk around saying at the market, God, God is there anything you want to do? Anybody you want to heal? A prophecy you want to give? A word of wisdom uh, that we might then take it and share the gospel? Even with the body, as we come in here, Lord, are we looking to use our gifts, being open maybe to share a word of encouragement, of comfort, uh, of something to somebody else, Lord, as we come here, not just to receive, but God, how do you want to use me? So I just pray, Lord, that you would use these things, as, as Paul said to Timothy, to stir these gifts up within us. Stir us up this morning, Lord, that we would be looking for these gifts, looking for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that we would see it more pronounced in our life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One last, I just thought of this verse here. One of my favorite verses, we'll talk about this next week, uh, but um, talking about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, chapter 14, verse 26, Paul says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all be done for edification. We'll talk about what he means, but, but one main thing is there, they each brought their gift to the table when they came. And when they came, some taught, some sang songs, some gave words of prophecy. And so everyone came with their gift looking to use it. And that always sticks to me. That was one thing we went through on Wednesdays. And I think the same with us is when you come to church, get excited. One, I want to receive, I want to worship, but God, how do you want to use me? And again, as we talk about some of these gifts, look to use that gift for the edification of the body.
this be our prayer. I just pray that you'd go for um, this time of fellowship that we're about to have. Lord, I thank you for bringing us all here and just giving us this time to um, gather and just um, chit chat and eat and just have a good time. Lord, we love you. And thank you so much. So um, I pray that right now all the conversations that we have would just be glorifying and edifying to you, Lord, and that you would just be in this place. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sunday and happy Thanksgiving. Have a great week, guys.